hired a consultant engineer, A.E. Com, out of Albuquerque, who will be conducting a study over the next six months, four to six months. Yeah. And this is the kickoff meeting. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim, and he can take over. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Welcome to the meeting. Uh, before we get really rolling, I'd like to make sure that you've all signed in so we know who is here. Uh, but also, you'll get uh, a copy of all these slides, as well as an agenda for the evening. So something you wanted to use to take notes on or what have you. <clears throat> as Bill indicated, my name is Jim D'Angelo. I'm from AECOM. Uh, AECOM is a worldwide engineering firm. We're about 80,000 to 100,000 people all over the globe. I'm based out of Albuquerque. Uh, my colleague, Sherrick, uh, he's an engineer. He's based out of Phoenix. And the other gentleman up here couldn't join us tonight. This is Mark. He was at our, our last meeting. He's also out of Phoenix. Uh, but we've got offices in pretty much every major city throughout the country. And we're using regional staff to complete the project. <coughs> um, what we do uh, locally with this is we're, we have expertise in all aspects of flood hazard mitigation. I'm a flood hazard mitigation expert. I travel the country looking at flood hazards, informing folks about what the steps they can take to protect themselves, to protect their communities. I've been through flooded communities post-Katrina, post-Sandy. Uh, it's really the bread and butter of what I do. I, I hate seeing folks impacted by floods, and so I do my best to help people avoid that. Uh, Sherrick is a professional engineer. He's the guy that's going to be working on the modeling that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight to find our answers down the road. Any questions so far? Okay, so why are we here? You folks know why we're here. The city of Aztec has had a couple flood events that have impacted a large portion of your community. Nobody likes to be flooded. A little bit of water is more than a headache. I know that. Uh, it has a large impact, not just on your physical possessions, but on your quality of life. It's dangerous to drive on flooded streets. It can impact your daily commute. It can impact your home and your possessions, your pets. It's, it's a big stressor on your life. The city recognizes these risks and included in your planning to start looking at some mitigation actions. And by mitigation, what we're looking at is steps we can take today, engineering-based steps, activities, that will reduce the risk down the road. And that runs the gamut between a study and a meeting and public outreach to, on an extreme scale, a giant concrete dam. Those are all mitigation actions. We'll talk a little bit more about that. What brought me here is we responded to the RFP, proposed our solutions, proposed our expertise, and we're engaged by the city to go ahead and complete our project. <clears throat> what are the goals of our project? We're here to reduce the risks to your life and the impacts to your life. Really, that's at the end of the day. But this is the first step. Today's meeting is the first step for the Blanco Arroyo project, and there are a lot of steps ahead of us. We're going to talk about the first three steps for our current project. We'll talk a little bit more about how that data might be used down the road. The first thing we want to do is understand the existing drainage characteristics of the Blanco Arroyo. What does that mean? Well, it's a stream, there's an arroyo, but what happens when that arroyo is flooded? How much water does it take to make a flood happen? What can we find out about the flood that did occur to help us prepare for the next rain event? These are the kind of questions that we're going to look at. Then we're going to take a look at potential mitigation actions. What can we do in the Blanco or around the Blanco to keep this flood from occurring again? Now, I can tell you that we're not going to ever get to the point where we create an engineering solution That'll keep everybody's house dry forever. It's just not possible to do. But we can look at solutions that make the most sense for the most people, or make the most sense from an economic perspective, or make the most sense from an ecological perspective. There's a lot of different ways to skin this cat. But if you're here tonight to hear that we're going to build the dam around the community and it'll never get wet again, that's not going to happen. I'm sorry. We're going to look at those kind of solutions down the road. We're also here to create public awareness. We want you folks to understand what we understand about the problem so you can take steps not only to protect yourselves and your neighbors, but then be aware of what might happen in the future. Because again, we're not going to be able to ever protect you from every storm, so you need to be aware of what might occur. And that awareness is really important. 
And lastly, at the end of the day, we'll have a set of conceptual drawings that will provide some of those solutions to the community that you might be able to enact moving forward, roughly around the 30% design point. So there will be some ideas there. And we're going to engage the community throughout this process to make sure that those ideas make sense to you. Uh, there's a lot of things that we could create and propose, and you know the community better than we do, of course. And you, oh, that's a dumb idea, Jim. We're here to hear that and to make sure that we work with you to go through that process. So we're really here to support you. Any questions so far? All right, we'll be done in no time. So what's the scope of our project? Uh, the scope really for this part of it is the Blanco Arroyo. Now, we have had a Coco Pelli at Hampton Arroyo meeting. Uh, I'm going to tell you that 98% of what you're seeing tonight was said to those folks uh, two weeks ago. So these projects are in parallel to each other right now. I'm going to talk about the Blanco moving forward, but you can almost just reinsert the word Coco Pelli in there if you have questions on that and hear the same thing. Uh, we broke it up just to make it a little bit more manageable. At the end of the day, you're going to be delivering almost the same product at the same time for both of those areas. We have three phases to our project. Phase one, oops, sorry. Phase one is data collection. That's where we're at right now. Phase two is hydrology and hydraulics. That's where we're going to do the science. Hydrology is how much water in a given area. Essentially, when four inches of rain falls from the sky, how much volume of water are we looking at in the Blanco Arroyo? Hydraulics is what that water does as it interacts with the ground surface. So you can imagine four inches of water in a Dixie cup. Look, sits there just fine, but if you squish that Dixie cup, that water comes out. So those are the kind of things that we're looking to see, how that water interacts with the ground as it goes through the arroyo, as it interacts with bridges or culverts or whatever it might hit. Does the water level go up? Does it spread out? Does it go down? And that'll be a big part of us understanding the problem. That's the first part of those solutions. And then we'll take that understanding and come up with the alternative analysis. So we're really looking at a, a, a collection of small projects that in aggregate have an impact to your community in a positive way. And that's important for you to keep in mind. At the end of the day, after we're done through our alternative analysis, you're not going to see folks out there moving concrete right away. There's going to be more engineering that's necessary. There's going to, funding is going to need to be applied. There's a lot of steps after that point. And when the projects are constructed, you're going to see small projects. But in aggregate, looked at as a system, can have a large impact. A little bit about data collection. Uh, we were in the paper just last week. So if the, if the photographer's here, I want to make sure you got credit at the Daily Press. But we, we went out and did the field. We walked the Blanco Arroyo. We walked the Cocopelli subdivision. We walked the Hampton. Understood what's going on. Uh, our field work included taking pictures, talking with locals that we encountered, uh, getting a good understanding of what these areas look like. Uh, we're also going to review the existing information. So we've received already information from the community. We've received LIDAR information, some other things. Uh, engineering data, we're incorporating that into our hydraulic models uh, as we speak. And then we need information from stakeholders. This is very important. Uh, in the back we have some flyers, some questionnaires. I understand that a lot of folks already got those. Uh, if you want to fill that out tonight, great. If you want to fill it out tomorrow and send it in to Mr. Watson, that'd be, that'd be wonderful as well. If you don't want to fill out the form at all and just want to write me a letter with photographs attached to it, that'd be wonderful as well. Uh, we're looking to collect data of your experiences of what happened in those storms. And if you do go down the road and give us that information, please be detailed. Dates are great. If somebody, if you happen to know how much rain fell, that's, that's a wonderful characteristic that we need to obtain. Um, if you send me a picture of a mud puddle without giving me any data on that mud puddle, it doesn't do me any good. So I need to know where it was, when it occurred, how deep was it. Um, as much information as you can provide is going to make our study more robust. It's going to make it more capable of getting our answers. Any questions? Okay. Sure. So we've already done some of this work. And this work started back when we put our proposal together and has continued on. So the study of hydrology and hydraulics 
is ongoing. We run models. We run computer-based modeling to get our answers and input data into that and run iterative models. It isn't very exciting uh, to watch, but the results can be pretty interesting. Um, based on our preliminary data, this is the FEMA floodplain. You can see it over top of the stream. And we know that water popped out of the channel and came down. Uh, what is that? Is that Blanco Street? And, and I've seen the photographs of, of what it did to that intersection with the sediment and the damage to the museum and what have you. Um, so we, we're aware of those problems. But we're probably not aware of every problem, we're probably not aware of everything that happened. So again, please get that information into Mr. Watson, who will get it to me. <coughs> Uh, here's another example. When we talk about hydrology, we talk about how much water will come into the stream. And to do that, we delineate something called a watershed. And this is just a rough idea of what the watershed, how much land. You know, if a raindrop falls here, it'll end up in the arroyo. If it falls over here, I believe this is the Hampton. It'll go into the Hampton as an example. So this is some of the work that we've just started to do. Uh, we know about the detention ponds up in the headwaters here, and have started to look at those as well. Uh, those detention ponds may have a big impact or may have no impact depending on how they're maintained and how they're oriented and how water interacts with them. This is a preview of, of what the modeling is going to generate. Now, it's not a great image. This isn't a, a very detailed map. But essentially what you have here, this is Blanco Street, and the blue is water based out of the, the, the hydraulic model. We are using a model called Flow2D. Now, Flow2D is a state-of-the-art model. It looks at water in two dimensions, which is important for us, so we understand how high that water can get. But water can also spread out in our model, which is different than the FEMA modeling you may have encountered on your flood insurance maps. So the model is going to get more detailed as we put more information into it. And the darker, in this map, the, uh, the darker the blue, the deeper the water is in our simulation. So this is the school system up here. You can see there's a dark purple pond here. There's the Arroyo Channel, nice and dark. Uh, but already we're seeing obvious flow paths down Blanco Street. Now, from your perspective, you know that already. You lived through it. But what we need to do is make our model reflect what really occurred to make sure that the model is accurate and then we can use that model to look at our mitigation actions. Questions? Yes, sir. The boundary there, there is what is called a school in way of even you, your map showing the, the ponds in the headwaters. School of Roya was actually part, see the, the dams to the, the left up there outside oh, here? the boundary. All of that was basically historically considered part of the Williams Arroyo. This Blanco Arroyo used to be called the Williams Arroyo because Williams subdivision was included in that area and it was named after that subdivision. Uh, more recently it has become Blanco Arroyo and School Arroyo, but School ultimately flowed into the Blanco Arroyo also, so I'm wondering if that area should not be included in the, the study. It's, it's entirely possible that uh, this, this uh, boundary is going to change based on the, we used the information we had available at the time uh, to make it. I don't know if the LIDAR that we have, the, the elevation information uh, was utilized for this. We, we made this as really just a, a blanket example. Uh, but what we're, we're going to have to do is we're going to have to follow the data we have. When it comes to establishing a watershed, it's really based on elevations. You're looking for that crown of the hill, if you imagine. If you were to spit here, it goes that way, and over here, it goes this way. So we have to depend on the data to show us where that water will roll. I was told that the, that the irrigation ditch uh, was, was essentially impacted and water came out of that that came into it from the arroyo. 
which you know that wasn't reflected so far. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this is just a preliminary. But again, these are great comments, and this is information. This is why we're here. We're here to collect this information from you, because we can only go so far with what we're able to see and what the data shows us. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, now, the, in August, my husband cleaned up the royal rainbow, and of course, had he not cleaned it, he would have been let it out twice as bad as we had been two years ago. So, how does that, how that affect like your study as to how it actually would have flooded had the royal not been cleaned up? Does that make sense? Because it, it, it hasn't been cleaned out when it flooded almost, which will be now three years in September. Changes of the arroyo as the arroyo uh, matures or, uh, you know, as seasons go by are an important factor to consider. Our model is going to be based off of the condition of the data that we have at the time. Uh, we can take a look at how those changes should be incorporated. And that's part of the field work that we did. Um, we were out there four weeks ago saw the whole arroyo and, and how it looks. So we're there to collect that data and change those things. But if you are aware of, of major differences, as, as an example, you know, tomorrow the arroyo turns left instead of right. Well, because it's cleaned out now. Right, so it's going to be, it's going to have more capacity. Yeah. yeah. And it had it been, you know, it'll be three years in September. Right, so, but we were out here in February and we, we saw. Yeah, I know. Okay. Right, with all that sediment coming down it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, if those notes you could add to the first questionnaire would be great as well. So and, let, and let us know exactly where that is. You know. Yeah, your street address would be great. There you go. Or parcel number. Yes, sir. We noticed the difference at the museum in the three floods, that, recent floods, in the material load that came down. The first two floods had uh, much more material in the water than the third flood. The third flood had less um, trash. trash in it, less sand. So it was, a, and the, so the water flew faster and deeper, um, and didn't deposit as much material as the first two floods. Now, was it a similar amount of water in your experience? It's uh, the the last two were pretty close. Uh, it just ran with more velocity, so it could have been a greater rainfall in the third flood. I don't know. But it changes the way the water moves depending on the material. And then, like up in the, up in, when they're talking about the housing developments along there, that could affect the, what happened in the flooding. Sure, the, the sediment load is an important factor. The weight is really changes, and, and it fills in, and then it, the sheets of water go right over where the fill in is and moves on. Uh, uh, at least in Main Street, it moved up and down the street. and. It, you know, a lot more force. Now, do you think that may have been because the previous storms cleaned out the arroyos? Yeah, the feeling yeah. that's what happened. Yeah. That was, that's what I would suspect to some degree. You know, and it, I think it was coming down, it washed it, it, you know, where those so, you know, the little dams are. I think those were pretty well loosened up and so it came on through just for the volume. It's nobody's fault. It's just what I observed. Well, that's great. Yeah, I mean, that's important. In the back, please. The, the first two rains that came up, it, <clears throat> it wasn't. There's a lot of sand, but that last one, that's when I got all the trash, the sticks, the... In our house. In the house. Yeah. Not, not just around the house, in the house. That's when you got it up there, Joy. Huh? Yeah, in August. The last rain that came from that was... The last one that came down, that's the one that got us the worst. Yeah. We went in the house. And, are, and where are you located, Miss? 409 Blanco. And is that at the top of the... Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know where the address... Where you were at a while ago walking with that guy? Yeah, that's... I'm on the other... On the other side. Up here? Yeah. Where you showed that picture, you and that kid walking on the hall door, that other man walking on the Arroyo Banks? Yeah. I'm across the Arroyo Catty Oh, okay. Close to the canal. Right below the canal. Me and the canal connect. That's what <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I live right next door to the, to the, the canal, the ditch. The Lower Animus Ditch is my boundary line. Property line. <laughs> yeah. That's gonna be up. Yeah, it's gonna be that way. Yeah. 
It's hard, isn't it? The school is right across the street. Yeah, I can, I can, I can picture that by the school. The school is right here. The there you go. There's the ditch, and we're here. Yeah. So that's right where it jumped. That's right where the arroyo jumped out. No, the arroyo jumped out up on Rio Grande at Blanco. There's the school right there. Okay, that's the school right there. Yes. Across the street at Blanco. Where's Blanco Street? Okay, you go across the street, you cross the canal, and you're on my property. Okay. Okay. You stole my clicker. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yes, did you have something to add? No? no. Sir? Um, I, I'm not a Blanco resident. I'm a Valley Community Focus on Okay. I live on the Hampton Royal. It was the 2013 flood with less water and there was less sand deposits. I have photographs. Great. 2013, 2015, more sand was deposited in 2000. 15 and 13 somewhat and most of it eroded out within well before they shut the water off in the ditch in mid November and it would be cut back to the sand. So I, 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 I was back there walking in that arroyo and it's really deeply in size there. Right okay yeah and uh, it's really interesting to see how much sand was was in that arroyo through those banks. Some of that, the, that's a little deceptive. The, the actual deposit level was a little higher. And as, as the water receded, it brought sand with it. Took it, took it back down. Yeah. Not a lot. The, those banks are ridiculous. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yes, sir. Rather than, than building a dam, would it be feasible to do you know, cement line canals like they have in Albuquerque? Like the, it, with the MAFCA, uh, they're, they're a big client of mine. I, I know their system very well. Uh, we're not at the stage yet where we can talk about what's feasible and what, what isn't. We're still trying to understand the science that goes into it. Uh, but at this point, that's not necessarily off the table. I can tell you a giant dam is off the table because that's pretty much off the table for anything. But Right, concrete channels have some advantages. They they are robust. They move a lot of water very very quickly. However, they're very very dangerous because kids like to play in them. Uh, they also have the disadvantage of not being great for water quality, and they're expensive. And so, this would probably be a good time to talk about that. When we talk about feasibility, we're looking at not just can it be built. We're looking at can it be built with the amount of money that's available? And one of the sources of money is FEMA. FEMA has money available after disasters for what's called mitigation. So that money's got strings attached to it. But it's one of the major sources of funding for projects like this throughout the country. And that string involves three things. First, it's got to be engineeringly capable. It's got to be a thing that an engineer can build. It's got to be safe. That's fine. That's easy. We can, we can design that. The second thing that it needs is it needs to be have a positive or balanced cost benefit. And that's the challenge. So a cost benefit is essentially a ratio between the amount of cost that it takes to build the thing, the system, and the amount of benefit that can be calculated statistically over the life of the system. So typically what that breaks down to is we're looking at a structure, a concrete structure, typically has a 25-year lifespan, all things being equal. And so now we're looking at if, if that structure costs $100,000 to put in, will it statistically save at least $100,000 over that 25 years? And there's, there's manuals this thick about how to go about doing that. And, my company can assist with you to get to that level if we get that far. Um, the flip side of that is the big storms that you encounter happen so rarely statistically. And I know that you've had three big ones in, in five years, but this is a statistical analysis that's mandated by federal 
rules, um, those aren't going to be cost effective. We're really looking at something between the 15 and 25 year reoccurrence. So that's a storm that occurs statistically once every 15 to 25 years. That's the sweet spot we're looking at to maintain that federal money. Now, if you folks have a large cache of gold someplace that I'm not aware of, you can build it yourself and we'll help you design it. And there are other sources of funding, but the big one is that FEMA funding. And that's really where that feasibility comes into play. So that's what we're trying to do. And the last- Can I donate the 25 foot on the sword outside? They're here. No, well, that's, that's exactly where I was going next. The last criteria is that federal money can't be used on private ground. So it's gotta be in the public domain to utilize it. And that, that right of way would need to be obtained in order to, for that to be useful. So FEMA money isn't gonna be used to build a little levy around your particular house as a, as a gross example. It's gonna be used for projects on public ground. So that donation may come in handy um, for the benefit of the whole community. So that's what I mean when I mean feasibility. Sir. The sand comes out of the hills, reaches the level. If there's any trash in it at all, or any obstruction, the sand just builds up and it just keeps increasing. I would speculate, even if you have concrete channels running down through, mm -hmm. you don't have slope enough to carry that sand. It's just going to build up as it goes down. In 2013, we have waves of sand on Blanco Street. Some of them probably a foot and a half to two feet tall. This last storm, that didn't happen because there wasn't as much uh, material. The, the sure, yeah. Was the, the trash coming down. That, but literally, there were waves coming down like this plate in 2013. Well, you bring up a really good point, and, and something to consider about any of these solutions is maintenance. Uh, whatever is constructed will need to be maintained. And that's a, that could be a significant challenge. We encountered some uh, grade control structures, big, you've, you probably know what they are, they, these big basket, looks like stair steps for giants in the uh, lower half of the Hampton. Some of them are failing. Um, they need to be maintained in order for it to work. Anything that we build is gonna need that protection, is gonna need to be maintained or it will fail just because the sediment load coming out of the mountains is so high and the water is moving so quickly. And how much sediment water can move is a function of its speed and how much and the size of that sediment. A lot of times the, uh, when, when a storm subsides or is you know, ending, the flows are much less and the velocities are less and that's when the material starts to fall out of the, of the flow and the rows, for example. Yes, sir. Uh, I used to play in that arroyo right for the uh, Arroyo crosses the uh, Blanco right above the school. Uh, and I drove up there the other day and I was amazed at how narrow that channel had become. Uh, there, where it crosses the road, I bet you it's one half, to, the carrying capacity is, is one half to one third of what it used to be. There used to be a, a railroad that would cross the Arroyo just, just be, between the, the uh, where it crosses Blanco and, and where it crosses Rio Grande, that was eight times, ten times as wide as it is now. And so what I saw, what I saw was that the water had jumped right at the at, at Rio Grande. And of course, that culvert, as you found out, is smaller than the one above. Yeah. And and then from Blanco up to Zia. Although the channel is fairly deep, it's, it's, it's very, very narrow. And I think, you know, that's probably one of the contributing factors to the water jumping where it jumps. One of the interesting things about water in general is that it, it wants to go where it wants to go. It's Mother Nature. She's in charge, like it or not. The problem is when we live next to it, we get in the way. We do stuff. And so maybe, I don't know, I mean, was it... Do you, do you think that channel was constricted due to development? So, we, right, so, so houses are too close. So the water wants to go there and the house is in the way. That's a problem. When we, when we narrow water, we make it go through a narrow conveyance. We, 
raise its elevation, we accelerate it. And when we accelerate water, what does it do? It's more erosive, it can carry more sediment, and it can do a lot more damage. Uh, so some of the solutions that we might think about looking far ahead, and I'm not there yet, but when, when we get to that point, are non-structural solutions. Suppose we were look at zoning regulations stipulating a minimum setback from a certain line within that arroyo, or we look at uh, building con constraints in these areas, in the headwaters at the bottom. These are things that other communities have adopted that more passively control the, the worsening, potentially, of, of the impacts that development can have. So I want you to think now, you know, not, every, not all the solutions are going to be concrete and steel. Some of them might be zoning changes, some of them might be regulation changes. Uh, and so those will be part of that proposal as well, to counteract things of that nature. The square house, they live behind me, my steps is my sister here. Their house was built in 1906. The, in 2000, when was the last one, 13? Or back there. These poor people got hammered. Uh, the, at the time, I was on the fire department, the, the, me and the chief of police at the time was Leroy Cruz. We went in their house because they were boating at Navajo Dam, like, you know, they could come home and done it. But we heard this thumping and we couldn't figure out, what is that? So we went and looked, and all her fruit jars in the basement were hitting the bottom of the house <laughs> on the floor. And, and But then, now that the flood comes, it leaves them alone, but it comes into Blanco Street and gets me. Yeah, because the way they designed that road there. They built it in the there, and they asphalt it. And, you know, you highlight something that's really interesting is that your experiences with two different floods were different. And they're going to continue to change for a couple of reasons. First, not every storm is the same. Second, every time there is a storm, the arroyo changes slightly. We've already talked about that. But it also highlights how important it is for us not to willy-nilly go in and just start doing things in the channel. We want to make sure that we're not fixing this problem and creating seven more downstream. And there's a, a, an idea about that. It's called no adverse impact. You could call it the good neighbor policy. But the whole idea is to look at this holistically. And that's what we're doing. We're looking at the arroyos holistically, coming up with that suite of changes with the intent that no one change or, or the collection of those changes isn't going to cause more harm. We're not here to do more harm. We're looking for a solution. And that's why we need to look at it from an engineering perspective and do this modeling now. When you uh, reviewed the retention pond, in your mind, uh, the way they're constructed right now, are they effective? You know, looking at them, it's not something I can make that judgment call on. I really can't. Well, what I know is we have very high walls, eight, ten foot walls, but the overflow may be only <coughs> two feet. There were some of those that really had no effect at all. Well, the important thing to keep in mind about any kind of retention structure is you see the top of the bank and you see the outfall. And that's, that's an important design function. You don't want that bank to overtop. And that's why they're designed that way. That's why there's that big discrepancy. So the water goes where it's designed to go and doesn't overtop that structure because if the whole structure overtops and fails, now you're looking at a much bigger problem all at once. Every situation is different. Yeah, and, and a lot of what, and, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. The, uh, a lot of those are small in footprint to begin with in comparison when you look at that overall watershed. So in a lot of cases, you're not going to have one impact from those. <coughs> Sir? Uh, those dams never used to be that way. It's only because the way the city has been using a in order to scoop out the dam, put the dirt, uh, they used to be maintained quite differently. Well, again, it goes back to maintenance. And a lot of communities go down this road and, and fail at the end of the day because of their maintenance. Um, New Orleans is a great example. New Orleans had Katrina, and Katrina was a terrible thing. And one of the reasons that it was so terrible is that they didn't maintain their levees which costs a lot of money. And when the levees are brand new or 10 years old and nobody's flooded, it's easy to say, oh, we're not going to mow them. We're not going to grub them out. We're not going to do X, Y, and Z because we can spend the money on whatever else. 
until the storm comes and you regret it. So it's something to keep in mind that there is lasting costs associated with these solutions. Why is that? Does everybody have that, that's the floodplain there? On this side, I see the high school side got all retention dams. Why is it all on the other side? That don't go to Blanco, will you? Oh, it's downhill from my house to your house. <laughs> So it's not going to come back to water, don't go unless, you know, never mind. Again, this, 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 it may not be a perfect watershed. This is an example that I put on the screen just to oh. show you some of the things that we're doing behind the scenes. All right. It's entirely possible that this line, at the end of the day, is going to wiggle a little bit. And this line is really telling us about how much, helps us determine how much water is going to be at a given point. And really what we're most interested in is this rather than that, as from the hydrology perspective. This is where your water is coming from. So we talked about this a little bit. You can see that it's pixelated. Uh, we're going to refine this data a little bit. It's still going to be pixelated. It's never going to be a, like a Google Earth map. But this is the end result. It's going to tell us velocities and depths of water. And then we're going to use that to build our alternatives. How much water? Where will it go? What will it do when it gets there? Somebody have a, no? <clears throat> all right, so we've touched on this a little bit, but our last phase of the project will be all, our alternatives analysis. And we're going to use information from phase one and phase two. Do a couple things. First, pri prioritize problematic areas. And I know what you're thinking. My house is a problem. We're going to look at it as a big picture, because again, this is a system. But again, back to that, your comments are very important. So please let us know. We're going to look at flood mitigation concepts right around the 25-year event. That's what we're looking at, not the 100-year storms. You've heard FEMA talk about the 100-year storms, I'm sure. That's a storm that statistically occurs once every 100 years. Could happen twice in the same week. Could happen three times in the same decade. The statistics. Yeah, right? So it's like roulette. It can't be black seven times in a row. Yes, it can. It can. You know, it's exactly what happens. So I've lost a lot of money that way. <clears throat> we're going to create a mitigation solutions map as well. So this will be a map of the area showing how, what we found and what those solutions might be. Here's the schedule. Um, this is, I'm sorry, sir, you had a question? Uh, are you going to be looking at, I mean, the city is planning on putting a bypass through the upper end of this, and are you going to be looking at how that, Well, right now, our study is based on the data we have today and the ground conditions today. It's possible to do that kind of analysis, but we don't have any of the information available to us. And I don't know if the plan is even farther enough along yet to look at how that watershed may be changed by that construction. Yes, I'm sure it'll be changed. That's obvious. But how specifically it'll be changed is important for this kind of modeling. And I don't believe we're at that stage yet. It's definitely not part of the scope today. Here we are with our schedule. Uh, we've done we've done our field work. Uh, we might be out there tomorrow measuring a couple things. Um, may or may not see us. We're not going to be knocking on folks' door. Um, take our, our surveys. So. Uh, again, I hope that today's meeting has given you some thought, given you some information, and, and you have some information to give us. And we'd like to receive that information by April 1st. Get it to Bill Watson, please. Or get it to us. That'll allow us to tweak our model, get it better. Uh, we want to have our hydrology and hydraulics, that's the, the base level science, knowing how much water and where to go, done by April 18th. And then we're going to have another public meeting. We want to show you that information. So. Be ready. Come on back. You'll be able to see some data. We'll start talking to you at that point about what we found. What do we know? From that point, we'll incorporate any comments we get. We'll look at alternative analyses. That's where we're going to be coming up with some of our solutions. Now, these aren't solutions that have to go in. These aren't solutions that will definitely go in. These are recommendations. 
that may warrant further study down the road. And then we're going to show you those alternatives in a public meeting, roughly around May 26th. These dates are tentative. Please don't block them off in your calendar yet. This is roughly our schedule. And we'll incorporate your comments from that alternative analysis. And our final delivery date is scheduled at this point to be the end of June. What will you be receiving at that point? That's where you'll have that detailed hydraulic, hydrology, H&H, &H, as well as a report indicating what those alternatives might be and 30% roughly of what those alternatives could look like a, a, from a design perspective. This is the first step for this project, though. And I said the same thing to the folks in the Coco Pelly. This is the first step. After that, there are many more steps to go. And it's important that you look at the long game here. Maybe two or three. 30%, I don't understand that percentage of what? Of, of a conceptual design. So you have 30% of the conceptual design that you're going to present. So 70% you're not going to be able to present. We're, we're not. <coughs> go ahead, Chair. Excuse me. 100% design would be like a full construction mid, document like that you would be out Would building. be a bid document. Yes, 30% is, is essentially that. It's about 30% level. Uh, so it's a that. design concept based on the data. Right, yeah. right. So an example would be a drainage pond of roughly this size, roughly here. Yeah. And now you, you know that there's a lot of design and engineering that has to go into making that a reality. But here are the problem areas. Here are some alternatives available to the problem areas. Yes, sir. Yes. So, and, that, and that's where the, this project will be. And for those of you that are interested in the Cocopelli, it'll be right there with it. That's the same. The same. It'll be a different suite of solutions, but it's going to be a suite of solutions at the 30% level and a report associated with it. Any questions on that? Okay. So the next steps, we're going to finish our data collection. We're going to complete the review of the existing material. We're going to capture your stakeholder input. That's, that's what you're going to give us. We're going to take a look at how that fits in. And we're going to, actually, this is now, we've already started the H&H, &H, the hydrology and hydraulics to a degree. So we're going to continue that and, and get, get it ready um, for that next meeting. That's where we're, we're moving towards. <clears throat> so again, this is just another, please, please get us that information. Uh, April 1st is good. Pictures are great. Narratives are great. But let us know where you live. Let us know what we're looking at. Please describe it. Okay. If I could add, too, if anybody has any gauges, rainfall gauges on their property, any information associated with those would be great. These would be useful as well. Um, one, one thing I, I can't resist to do. I belong to a, a nonprofit organization, and I, I travel, and I, I want to make sure that you folks know, please don't drive through moving water. I know you've got a lot of experience with it. Here's a little statistic for you. More people are killed in this country in their cars in fresh water than any other water-related incidents. And that includes the hurricanes that you see on TV and all that other stuff. It's folks trying to get from here to there, and they try to drive through that water, and we've all seen what can happen, so please turn around, don't drown. We'll give you a sign, whatever it takes. That's a public service announcement. <clears throat> Any questions? We've had a lot of great questions. You guys have had a lot of great information. What else can I do for you? I have a question. It's pretty much outside of your scope, but maybe somebody here could point us to any resources that could help us figure out how to personally re-landscape our yard. Because what swooped through there last August, we've never seen before. And we realize areas that should be built differently, designed differently. We're not engineers. We don't know what to do. What resources are available for that? Who do I call? What do I, who helps me? <clears throat> I'll first caution you. I don't know anything about your house or where you live, but I'm sure you have neighbors. So whatever you decide to do, you don't want to impact them. Right. There, there's a lawsuit yeah. waiting to happen, um, but you're going to want to hire a professional. Uh, landscape architects might be the right place to start. 
um, maybe a local engineering firm. I'm not the right guy. <laughs> Bill will tell you what to do. <laughs> maybe hand you some sandbags. I, I don't know. Oh, we've got sandbags. <laughs> <laughs> they are still there. They haven't moved. My son won't let them move. He's still scared he to death. He steps over them all the time. Don't let those sandbags divert water onto your hair. I know. Yeah. I know. That is a fear. <coughs> Dig a really big. Stuff ended up across the street, and if we want to get it out of there, I don't know how to get it out of there other than across the street. Well, was it yours maybe from something else on down? Because it hadn't happened before. I don't know. I've never seen it in the 15 years. But yeah, and then it just went through the whole. Okay, kit. so I'll call you. Maybe you can tell me. Yeah, to call and get some advice. Great. Do you have something so you want to say, Bill? Yeah, I, I, I want to encourage you all to leave your email address. Uh, we were out passing flyers out this last weekend, and uh, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. So uh, we're going to be using email addresses the next time. And, of course, our local, our, our usual media outlets. Uh, but we won't be uh, knocking on door to door and handing out flyers next time. So please leave your email addresses so that we can get a hold of you for the uh, next time that we have our meeting. Jim indicated that the schedule was tentative so that uh, solid meeting time and date for the next meeting will be emailed and posted in our, local, in our usual uh, media outlets. So I'm just letting you know we're not going to walk around door to door the next time. And to build off that, if you have a neighbor that couldn't be here and is just dying to see the presentation, understand it will be on YouTube, on the city's channel on YouTube. So. It's there for you to uh, watch it over and over again if you were that entertained. Any, uh, any other questions? Miss, I'm sorry, you were cut off. Our neighbors, uh, the water from Blanco went over from the highway into her yard and then her yard flooded ours in front. We were wanting to do something, some type of landscape to keep her water from coming into ours. Yeah, but then you said it, it's didn't, mine. It, <laughs> didn't, it didn't affect her because she's in a hole. And she's higher than I am. There might be things you can do. It's, you know, it's kind of out of our purvey, and it would be wrong for me to give you any kind of counsel without knowing any of that information. Uh, just be cognizant that your changes could have larger impacts that you might be responsible for. So you need to be really concerned about that. Um, but there are, there are, I'm sure there are things that you can do to make yourself feel more comfortable with it. The only thing you really do need to worry about is if you retain water, whatever you're using to retain water breaks, you have a much bigger problem than if that water came up slower. Just food for thought. So if you hire a professional to do your landscaping and that impacts your neighbor, then that professional would be, have to assume some collective. Make sure you thought of it. <laughs> yeah. I think the big things to be, some of the big things to be worried about would be grade changes on your property and uh, construction of like walls or something that would pull water in or divert water towards the neighbor. Yeah, because there's nobody other than the royal behind me. It's her water from her yard coming into mine. And the only thing that's behind me is the royal. The royal is flooding me from behind, and then she's flooding me from Lyco Street, water going into her yard coming into I flood, so we're getting flooded from the back and the front. And make sure you characterize that in the survey if you can. Oh, yeah, we have pictures and stuff okay. because we waited to fix our house, and then we waited to fix the yard, and we had just fixed it. That's the way Sir, you had something to say? Oh, is it at the museum? I, I don't know. Maybe we have 50000 Maybe sixty thousand dollars in the in the three floods. That's conservative. There's a lot of volunteer labor in there. It has taken out every time. It's taken out all the shrubs, all the all the roses, all the flowers, all the flower boxes, and it. So you got, and if we change that and put sandbags up along the fence, then we wipe out the hardware store, and, you know, the barber shop. So we got to keep that open to get it through there. And then when it goes through there, it wipes you out. So, you know, I think it's difficult. And the water's going to move, like the man says, where it's going to move. And that velocity gets up. And you drop it in teeth and then everybody. Yeah, levees na nationwide. This is the problem with the levee. You're, you, you make this area dry, you've pushed the water. 
on the other side of the river. You put a levee over there, now you've pushed the water up upstream and you've got it downstream faster. So there is a lot of big changes that can occur. You know, folks, I will go around and I say, oh, we're going to do something, and they want to see a giant eight-foot wall. It's rare that we're able to do that, and it isn't always the best solution. The museum problem is when that bridge at Rio Grande plugged up, the, the little bridge up there at Rio Grande Blanco, that's when the museum gets it. That's when I get it. The Arroyo has never flooded me. You know what I'm saying? I have never gotten flooded by the actual Blanco Arroyo. What it is is when it plugs up that bridge up at Rio Grande, it comes around, it gets to school, it comes on down Blanco, it comes into my house, and down, straight on down Blanco Street, which lines straight up with the museum. Right, so, so maybe a solution would be to make that culvert wider. Yes. Now, if we do that, just to give you an idea of the kind of things that we think about, okay, well, that's going to do what? That's going to get the water downstream quicker. Now, does that mean we need to make that culvert, whatever that might be, bigger? Maybe. And if we don't... We can afford it a lot more than we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Sir. Kind of what, what happens is when those become damp, and then it goes wide. Yeah. I mean, it's way off of your map where, you know, past these, these culverts, which are small, trash up real quick, and then there's not a culvert anymore. And it just goes, you know, sideways. And, yeah, and that's why I'm using a two-dimensional model, because it captures that motion of the water. Yes, we haven't heard from you yet tonight. Yeah. Although we got flooded in the 80s, that subdivision wasn't up there. And it came, mm -hmm. the, the Arroyo was 17 foot deep, and I've got a six foot fence. And it came over the top of that, and we took 10 dump truck loads of sand out of our yard. I believe that. Yeah. It didn't stop it. It was on Lover's Lane, right here behind the high school. Pretty impressive what it can do, isn't it? Yeah, she's on one side of the array and we're on the other side. So I said the route comes off this side, no. And then after that, that subdivision came in, we didn't get flooded anymore. It went her way. And because it plugged up that bridge here at Rio Grande and came around. It didn't, the Arroyo didn't, has never flooded me. The actual Arroyo never has. And the big ditch has never really flooded. It come up some. But not like it did. Not like it did this last time. It came all from the street. Yeah. She, she's talking about Creekside. Yeah. Okay. Oh, where the Rincon Theater used to be, and there was trailer houses that brought down from the top of the hill, behind the theater thing, down into that area. They were washed down from that trailer park up above the hill, off of Pollard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was just the driving. That was it. Was just dirt, and so it could hold the water. I guess I don't know. Channel, their Doberman had about this much space before it couldn't even fit in that pen. And we had to get that dog out of there, and it was a mean, vicious Doberman. But the first thing, the dirt had gotten so high, and they were gone, and the dirt had got so high that dog couldn't even stand up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to save the dogs, you know. But they, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? No other questions? Well, that's what I came to, uh, to talk to you about tonight. I really appreciate your time. You guys have been a great audience. You had a lot of great questions, and we got some good information from you. Um, so that, that's it. That's, we'll be back in a couple, maybe in a month, I guess, roughly a month and a half, to talk about some results. Uh, Bill, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I just want to thank you all for coming, and we appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you.